welcome back. We're live. It's one o'clock rock here on Tuesday. <laughs> okay, and we have a special guest. That's Kenji Price from Car Carl Smith Ball here on Think Tech Tech Talks. And that's the show reserved for technology stuff. Welcome to the show, Kenji. Thank you, Jay. Great to have you here. Thank you. So you brought to my attention a case that was decided only a few days ago, like mm, less than two weeks ago, I guess. Um, by the Ninth Circuit, by uh, Judge Clifton on the Ninth Circuit, who is a Hawaii lawyer, actually. Everybody on Bishop Street knew him at one point. Now he's off in San Francisco, but he visits Hawaii plenty, I think. He has his office here, as a matter of fact. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this case involved the Internet. This is so interesting. And this is a case that has, conceivably, it has huge effect on the Internet. We like to think of the Internet as free. I always thought that it was, a, you know, back to the 90s when it was first invented. Al Gore it was, wasn't it? <laughs> I, I don't remember. <laughs> I, I was a young fellow yeah, back young in the 90s, then. I'm proud to say. Um, where, you know, uh, we wanted it to be free. We wanted it to be a new expression of communication around the world. We didn't want any any negative things or any, uh, you know, anything that, that uh, Im imposed restraint on it. And that's been, that's been the tension, maybe increasingly so. And because the internet is so powerful and there's so much money, so many people, so many ideas, so many things happening all day long, well, it becomes a, a subject for discussion in the courts and the legislatures. So can you tell us about this case? It's uh, internet brands um, versus uh, what? Jane Doe or Jane Doe versus internet yes. brands. That's correct, Jay. Th this case is a, it's a tragic one, uh, for starters. Um, and perhaps I'll describe some of the background to the case before we get into the details. Uh, just as a general matter, there was this federal law um, that's called the Communication Decency Act. And this law aimed at innovation and communication over the Internet. And basically what this federal law does is it protects websites like Facebook and Craigslist and other on online re retailers from the bad acts that are committed by the people who use these websites. People who post content on the websites, people who do trade on the websites. This federal law effectively protected the website from those bad actors. So the website owner is not responsible for criminal activities that take place on or by virtue of that website. That was the general understanding, or at least before um, this case. How, how old brands. is that statute? Uh, that statute I'm not sure entirely when it was enacted, but I could find that out and get back to you about that. Okay. For sure. So now this statute is in play in this case. Yes, it absolutely is. What's the facts? Um, basically, what happened in this case was there was a company um, that had a website. Uh, Internet Brands is the company that owns a website called ModelMayhem.com. What Model Mayhem is, is it's a website that allows people who are aspiring models to post photographs and profiles in the hopes that they'll get hired. So Sounds like, like Match.com. It, it's sort of like a Match.com for models. <laughs> so what happened was about 600,000 people use this, this website. So there was a model who used this website, the Jane Doe, and there were two individuals who were basically stalkers. They used the website to look at people or look at aspiring models, then lure them into going to a location. Once the models went to that location to get a contract, they would then drug the models, and then rape the models. And then they would post the videotapes of the rape online as oh, pornography. Oh, oh. Now what happened was these two individuals oh, eventually were, they were caught for what they did and, and punished for what they did. Um, but in this case specifically, Jane Doe, who was a victim, she sued internet brands. And basically what she says in her complaint to the court, um, her complaint says that internet brands knew about the bad behavior of these two individuals raped her. She never had to, to actually prove that yet. Not she, yet. All she did was no. make the allegation. This is very early in this litigation. So she's just making the allegation. She says internet brands knew what these people were doing, but did not tell her, did not warn her. So the, the legal term used for this kind of case is a failure to warn type case. So she sues internet brands under California law. Internet brands then comes back and says, well, we can't be held liable or we can't be held responsible for your injuries because there's this federal law that I just described to you, the federal law called the Communications Decency Act. Under this federal law, we are not responsible for what people do, this type of bad behavior that's done on our website. That was their response. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals... That was a motion to dismiss yes. the complaint. Yes, they moved to dismiss the complaint. And, and that to, succeeded in the, in the federal district court? 
Uh, I believe so. I believe so, but again, I'll have to check that and, and confirm it. Okay. Uh, my main concern and our concern is the Court of Appeals because they es essentially make the law that governs a case. When this went up to the Court of Appeals, the Court of Appeals said, not so, Internet Brands. The court said, at this stage in the case, if she says that you knew what was going to happen and you didn't warn her, you can be liable. You can be on the hook, even though this, there's this federal law out here that, that you think preempts the claim. That's the legal term used. Uh, but that, and that would be a, a theoretical possibility in the sense that she still has to prove that they knew. Absolutely. She would still, if, if the case, well, the case is advancing beyond this pleading stage or this early stage. It's been stage. referred back for, to the yes, court for, for trial, I guess. Yes, it has. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of things that happen before trial. But assuming the Jane Doe's claim can proceed through the entire course of the case, she'll still have to prove that they knew and failed to warn and that that was a violation of a duty that they had to her. So that duty trumps the statute. I hate to use that term, but that right. duty trumps the statute. I don't know if trumping is the right way to, to put it. I think the, what the Court of Appeals is essentially saying is they can coexist. They're basic, the Court of Appeals is basically saying you have a federal law, and it protects Internet brands against some lawsuits, just not this one. Yeah. So they can coexist just separately. And the right. duty outside the federal law is a state duty, I guess. Yes. This is generally when you have harms that are caused by personal injuries. If someone's injured, um, car crashes, things of that nature. Generally, those duties are state law duties, and they're state law. So you're going to have different, different laws about this in different states. Yes, and this is one of the important things about this case for companies like Internet Brands or anybody who hosts a website where people exchange information or like a Match.com. These companies have to familiarize themselves now with the state laws all over the country, depending on where they operate. What was Clifton's uh, rationale, um, you know, in finding that? What, what, what was he, where did he want society to go uh, in making this ruling? Now, I, don't, it's, I don't want to read too much into where he wanted the country to go. I think what Judge Clifton did was he really applied the law as he, as he understood it. And I shouldn't say just Judge Clifton, because there were two other judges you know, who were he on this case. He wrote the opinion, though. He wrote the opinion, yes. Um, what just Judge Clifton basically said was, What's going on here is you knew, or at least it's been alleged that you knew what was happening. All you need to do is warn someone about this harm, warn the users of your website, whether it's through email, you can warn them through a, num a number of different ways. Uh, you can warn them about the harm. We're not saying that you're responsible for something bad that somebody said on the internet. For example, if you look at a company like Facebook, Facebook has people who post messages all the time. Those messages could be defamatory or could speak lies about people. Sure. They could be offensive. Same thing with YouTube. Absolutely. I mean, you're putting out information yes, could be absolutely. objectionable or illegal exactly. uh, in, in one way or the other. And so I guess it's a duty. Now, in, yeah. the, in the case of, I don't know if this was decided or not, but there was an you know, issue about YouTube um, putting out uh, videos that were infringing somebody's copyright. Mm -hmm. And I think they actually worked pretty hard um, to identify infringements and to mm -hmm. stop them. And that's, that's something that obviously is very prudent for companies to do. Um, but that also is tied to this case in a way because the duty that's discussed in this case, the duty to warn, the duty basically arises when the company knows about a harm. So if a company doesn't know about a harm, then the company's not on the hook. For not warning. But the other complication of this case is if you're a company like Craigslist, you may get hundreds, if not thousands, of reports about bad behavior on your websites. Just like the federal government gets reports all the time about possible terrorist acts. Do they need to follow every single lead? I think companies like Craigslist and Facebook now have choices to make. You know, when they get reports that come from who knows the source, who knows how credible the source is, now they have to, some of these reports. They have to investigate, they have to get to the bottom of them, and if they find out that they're credible, at least according to the court, they have an obligation to say something. So in this case, taking they could have an obligation this opinion from that, yeah. that, that panel and yeah. that judge, um, then had uh, internet brands um, known about this, if in fact that's true, then they should have taken some action against uh, those guys. So uh, uh, you had the names in your memo here. Yes, the, the names of these individuals are Levant Flanders and Emerson Collins. Okay, yeah, but they were in another state too, weren't they? Yeah. South yeah. Florida. They yeah. lured her from California to South Florida. Yes. 
Uh, it's interesting. I just uh, an aside on that. If I'm going to make a trip across the country mm -hmm. um, to meet some guys who are going to make me a model, mm -hmm. I, I I would do my own due diligence on them <laughs> before I paid the, my That's my it. way across the country. That, that certainly strikes me as a prudent idea. But in a case like this, you know, it's just tragic what happened and. Yeah. Um, I think the focus of the opinion is clearly just more on internet brands and what should internet brands yeah. have done. So, um, so had yeah. they done some, some uh, inquiry, or if they knew, had they gone further with the inquiry yeah. and possibly cut these guys off mm -hmm. or possibly told Jane Doe, you know, do, no. don't do this or you better watch out because these guys have done bad things in the past, they'd be off the hook. I think they wouldn't. Based on this opinion, they probably wouldn't have a problem. Now, to answer that more fully, and what the court did, was very careful to do in this opinion, was the court did not opine much or, or speak much about the state law issue. Like, what exactly would satisfy the duty? The court said this is just about whether the federal law says you have no state law claim. But if Internet Brands had warned uh, Jane Doe, uh, it would probably be difficult, just on its face, to say there was a failure to warn problem, of course. Um, and, and, and as we discussed, there's, there's multiple ways they could have done that. Yeah. Uh, communicate with her directly. They could have sent out a disclosure to all of their users if they wanted to. There's, a, there's things that they could have done. Well, let's, let's look um, at that. Let's yeah. look at that. Suppose I'm an internet yeah. brands guy, and I'm worried about this case. Uh, I should be worried about this case, because this is a, a new idea, maybe, that we weren't prepared for on the internet. It yeah. certainly is a, a constraint on, you know, the, the free use of the internet. Yeah. Um, suppose I, I say, well, I, I give a lot of legal notices. I mean, already the lawyers have told me I got to put the notices about this, that, and the other thing. So I'm going to just put this paragraph somewhere in my legal notice page, because at the bottom of my home page, it's going to say legal notices. Mm -hmm. And I add a paragraph, make it paragraph 42. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's the same typeface. Yeah. And it says, you know, there are some people out there who misuse this model site, mm -hmm. and you have to be careful. Um, so, you know, do your own due diligence and make sure that you don't get mugged mm -hmm. in some way. Um, okay, with that, and I, I make it a complete notice, and I, I make it, I make it a strong notice. I watch out; bad things could happen to you. You, you could, you could get hurt here. Um, is that enough? It depends. Uh, which is probably the most ungratifying response that, that you could no, receive. It's a very lawyerly response. Absolutely. So. <laughs> true to my profession. Um, it, it really depends. Uh, I think that in these types of cases, um, in any case that involves a warning, I think courts would look at a variety of things. Uh, I think some of the things that you mentioned, how big is the font? Uh, they could look at, you know, do they send it in an email or just put it on a web page? I think all these factors could matter. Uh, I think a company that was in that position, obviously the most prudent thing to do is speak to your retained lawyer, tell them about all the details, and ask your lawyer if that's enough. Uh, although I don't want to speculate without knowing exactly what the company is, what the company the lawyer's does. Lawyer's going to be very the, careful about this, you know, because absolutely. in this case, Jane Doe was raped, and yep. then she was made into a pornographic item, you know, on the web. But she could have been killed. Absolutely. She could have been killed in a, 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 a terrible, terrible, brutal way. It could have made the front page all over the country, and that changes the stakes, don't you think? Then you want to go back and say, gee, we should have used the biggest font possible. <laughs> we should have put it on our home page right in the middle. We should have put it as a condition of signing up. We should have made it a huge warning, not a, not a little one. Uh, only in retrospect, because she got killed, yeah. the damages are huge, and there's pressure. You know, this case recently about in Stanford, there's pressure mm -hmm. on the judge yes. now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you get, you, you don't know what's going to happen these days, and if it's bad, it's going to turn things yeah. somehow beyond what you would have predicted. Believe me, I, I definitely understand, and you know, th these types of cases, of course, are near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, I was a federal prosecutor in, in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, violent crime, I fully understand how awful it is, and, and where we can prevent it, we absolutely should. Um, but this context is very complicating on, on several levels. What happened to her is tragic, and fortunately the criminal justice system has dealt with these two individuals who committed this, this horrific act. Um, on the internet side, though it raises serious concerns, um, on the one hand, we're going to have a break, because that's the real payload of this discussion. Okay, what are the implications of this ruling? 
Uh, we're going to take a short break. That's Kenji Price of Carl Smith Ball, former U.S. attorney, prosecutor person. We're talking about evolutions in the law of the Internet here on Think Tech Tech Talks. We'll be right back. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Aloha. My name is John Waihe, and I used to be a part of all the things that you might be angry at. I served in government here and may have made decisions that affects you. So I want to invite you in. I want to invite you in to Talk Story with me and some very special guests every other Monday here at Talk Story with John Wahee. Come on in, join us, express your opinion, learn more about your state, and then do something about it. Aloha. Bingo, we're back with Kenji Price of Carl Smith Ball, former U.S. attorney, uh, a prosecuting attorney uh, in the Eastern District of New York, and many other things in his very interesting life, which we will cover in another show some other time. <laughs> He's a very interesting man. Anyway, we're here at Think Tech Talks, and we're talking about evolutions in the law of the Internet. We're talking about Internet brands uh, and, a, and a suit against it uh, by Jane Doe, in, I guess in San Francisco. Um, so, you know, the implications of this are huge. I, you know, since we spoke about it, since uh, I've seen, you know, your write-up of the case, I've been talking to other lawyers, and we all agree this huge implications for the Internet. Because, you know, if you make a good notice, that's fine. But we all know that there's no... There's no black and white standard on the notice. Mm -hmm. The notices can be good enough or maybe not. And in a hard case, they're not good enough. Mm -hmm. And so the notice could go away. And yeah. then you have then you have the full throated implications of this for the internet. What what is your what is your thinking about how this affects the development of the in internet? There's several ways that it affects the development of the internet. Although before I get there, I gotta correct you on something. I was an assistant U.S. attorney, not the U.S. attorney. There's a lady named Loretta Lynch, yeah. attorney general of the U.S., who, you know, I don't want to take her old job. She used to be my boss as a U.S. attorney <laughs> in New York, so I don't want the old call I, saying... I stand corrected. ...saying, Kenji, uh, <laughs> if I was correct about this, I was the U.S. attorney and you were the assistant guy. <laughs> I'm just teasing We're you accurate uh, here on this I, show. I, I, have, to, I have to clarify yeah. that. I still have a lot of friends in New York who may <laughs> okay. call and say, did you get a promotion that we didn't hear about? Um, but anyway, so some of the implications about this opinion. Um, first, I, one very real concern for large companies is what's called the chilling effect that this opinion could have on companies. What they mean by chilling is obviously not temperature. Um, what they mean is that we want companies to be innovative. We want them to facilitate a robust discussion on the Internet. We want them to bring all the technology they can bring to bear to make it easier for people to communicate, to promote business. Whenever you have a ruling like this that comes down and harms those ends, arguably, it could have what's called a chilling effect. Internet companies may become risk averse. They may say, well, maybe we should take a step back with our matchmaking services. Why? Because we may get sued, we may get hundreds of lawsuits around the country every time somebody's hurt who use our website. So the chilling effect is one of the concerns that uh, is a very pressing one. Another concern is something that I sort of alluded to earlier, which was this concern that a company has a problem for failing to warn, at least in California, if they know about bad behavior. We should be encouraging companies, or we want to encourage companies, to investigate bad behavior and find out about it. If they don't know about bad behavior, obviously there's no failure to warn problem. Or so if they yeah. warn people that they yeah. have not checked it out and that people have to check it out themselves, they should be off the hook yeah. then. Should be, but... But you know, who, knows? Course, who knows? knows? In a bad case, hard facts, if, if this yeah. woman was killed, yeah. you know, or whatever, I mean, however you see it, uh, that could set aside that possibility. Absolutely. And that, but these are all, both of those are significant concerns. I, I would say the, the third concern that is one that uh, Facebook's lawyers and Craigslist, Facebook, Craigslist, and some other parties filed a brief in this case. And a concern that they raise that is a very pressing one is sometimes desirable content is on these websites that can lead to Facebook getting sued. For example, if you think about in Hawaii, we have these, uh, in Hawaii and elsewhere, sometimes you have social movements and protesters who spread their message online. For example, we saw 
a few days ago, the Shaka movement, right? Regardless of what position you take on, on the cause or the issue, I think generally we all agree that on some level, social free speech, social protests are something that should be allowed in a democracy, of course. Um, these organizations, whether it's Shaka Movement, whether it's Occupy Wall Street, you name the organization. Facebook is obviously a good place for them to put out their message. Now, the concern, one concern with this opinion is that if Facebook or some other website knows that people get hurt during these demonstrations or get hurt in connection with these events, do they have, have an obligation to warn people about them? Uh, I'm not saying how that would come out. That's another issue that's, you know, it's a sticky one. The courts would have to wrestle with that. But we should also think about desirable organization that happens on the website that could result in injury to people. Yeah. And on the other hand, you have, there's some, just to take a different, look at this from a different perspective, uh, the opinion does some things that some could argue is really good for society and, and for the law. Um, I think somebody could fairly argue that companies like Facebook or Craigslist are in a unique position. They're the ones who know about what's going on. Yeah. Um, the two individuals who committed the rape in this case, face, uh, the, the excuse me, not Facebook, internet brands, according to the complaint, knew about it. So these companies that operate these websites are in a unique position. They have the information and they can warn somebody. Shouldn't we be in, one could argue, we should encourage them to do so. Whatever the law can do to prevent this type of injury, we should do. And then the other, a uh, question one could ask is, well, if companies are doing a good enough job self-policing, it shouldn't be a problem for them to warn people. Because presumably, if they're self-policing, meaning if they are investigating thoroughly and getting to the bottom of any threats or any reports, then they would be in a good position to tell others, look, you better be careful. Or if they investigated and there's no threat, then there should be no reason to tell others. But it's sort of the argument that, well, if you're doing just fine, we wouldn't have to get involved or people wouldn't be suing you. Um, whether that's true in every case is up for debate, but in some cases it could be. Uh, and then you, the, the other question that I think somebody reading this opinion or, or following this area of the law could always just say, what's the big deal? You know, you, you know about what's gonna happen. Why is it so difficult, as you pointed out earlier, to put a little disclaimer in your, on your website? Why is it so difficult to send out an email to say people are doing bad things on our website. So I think there's arguments, there's implications where on both you, where sides. Where do you come out on it, Kenji? Now, I, I think that this is a very difficult issue. Um, I think that there are fair arguments for saying that this opinion wasn't good for policy, but there are also very good arguments for saying it was very good for policy. I think I'm gonna stand by and watch how this law plays out. Um, watch what happens um, when other courts weigh in on this. See what, if any of these implications actually turn out to be true. Um, not being on the Ninth Circuit, I have the luxury of being a bystander and, and see a luxury. <laughs> you don't think it's going to go. Judge Supreme Clifton Court. doesn't have. That's that's a really a hard thing to tell at this stage. I think that um, you know, Supreme Court considers a lot of things, of course, in deciding when they'll take on a case. Um, something like this, maybe if other courts weigh in, it'll rise to that prominence. But it really, that is really speculation. At the end of the day, the Supreme Court could weigh in; they may not. Um, but I, I think it has such broad implications. Uh, that it's certainly something that people will be paying attention to. Yeah. Internet, internet brands, uh, you know, 600,000 mm -hmm. mm, people come, yeah. come and go. Uh, that doesn't sound that big these days, you mm -hmm. know I mean? Uh, what do we have in, the, in that recent transaction, LinkedIn, Microsoft bought LinkedIn a few days ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of people there, the number of users on LinkedIn is 430 million. Yeah. Um, so 600,000 is really, you know, kind of small. I completely understand, although you can understand why, on the other hand, Facebook, Craigslist, Tumblr, companies like that would file a brief in oh, a case sure. like this. And it's in their interest. It's in the billions. And, and be th in their interest to, yeah. to try to get this up to the Supreme Court because this ruling is adverse to their interest. Oh, and absolutely. the question is whether Internet Brands yeah. has, has the reason and the resources yeah. to take yeah. it up to the Supreme Court. It's not cheap. To go and one there. thing you're highlighting is, is one of the real risks with litigation. Some companies or individuals can literally get bled out, to, to use a term, sure. where they just keep bleeding money and they just can't keep dumping money into a litigation. Um, so a case like this, I'm not sure, um, but it is definitely a real concern how far this will go, yeah. how, how much they can afford. Although I think you know, a, a company is gonna be more likely to be able to afford pursuing this further, but 
then again, I don't know internet brands as financial. I think uh, this yeah. judge, this panel, Judge yeah. Clifton and this panel, very influential around the country. Yeah. They cover Silicon Valley. Yeah. They cover, you know, a lot of software writing. Yeah. And uh, query whether another, another panel in another circuit right. is mm -hmm. going to disagree so quick. Or maybe in New York, right. you know, in the Eastern District somewhere, you know. <laughs> Well, what I <laughs> might disagree, but you know, I, I think the probabilities are going to say. I can well, assure you, the Eastern District will get it right every single time. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> no. No, so you know, where I come out is um, nice that Facebook has the resources to investigate mm -hmm. all the possibilities, all the leads, yeah. all the complaints that may come up. But there's an awful lot of you know young entrepreneurs, startups mm -hmm. out there that are actually doing the same thing in the way of making matches. That's the genius of the internet as it has evolved in the past 20 years. Uh, it is really good at making matches. And so any match is potentially a subject for a case like this. You know, bringing strangers together involves a certain risk. And so if they don't get the warning right, or if they don't have a warning at all, or if the judge doesn't respect their warning, they're in trouble. Little guys, lots and lots of little guys. So yes, I think that uh, you know Facebook and LinkedIn, for that matter, and uh, the big guys, they can afford to comply uh, with the research aspect, you know, the research and warning aspect. Um, but uh, the little guys, you know, could put them out of business in no time flat. That's a very, very good point. I mean, I can, uh, and you made it uh, very eloquently. I think that the small guy, just as large as the large guy or, or girl, needs to be concerned here. But this could easily if a case like this if a lawsuit like this continued forward right for years and years it, it could really just empty out the pockets of small startups yeah. and uh, with startups obviously that's a huge concern you know when they're in their infancy yeah. so I think this has huge implications for the Facebook's of the world also for uh, the smaller smaller internet companies or excuse me companies that operate websites so okay. short term and what's your advice <laughs> uh, there's Vivian that's our camera number two over there Okay. <laughs> and if you could just talk to Vivian for a minute and, and tell Vivian what you think a small internet, you know, a website company could do, should do at this yeah. point to, to improve its position in, yeah. in the face of this opinion. I think the, the first thing I would tell anybody first is get a, get a lawyer, explain the facts of your case to that lawyer so they can give you a detailed opinion that actually can guide your conduct. Uh, I obviously am not in a position to do that. Uh, speaking more broadly, so nothing I say here is something that you can actually use, but more broadly what you can do is just stay abreast of what's going on in, in this area of law. It's a very complicating area. It's an area that obviously is developing and there are a lot of smart people weighing in on what's happening. So just try to keep your pulse on what's going on in the cases. Uh, these opinions are published for the public to read. Um, there's a lot of commentary that people are putting out on the internet. I mean, I can't tell you who's right and who's wrong about an issue, but I think just staying informed, knowing that something happened, knowing that the Ninth Circuit just issued an opinion about Internet companies, that'll lead you to then hire the lawyer, explain what your disclaimer looks like, explain what your business looks like, and then that lawyer can definitely help you and steer you in the right direction. Uh, that's the best advice I can give at this juncture. Yeah, and for the short term, this isn't going to go away. This, this is what a small uh, website proprietor needs to focus on, as you say, needs to check out what's happening, needs to follow the action, follow the, the implications of it, and maybe uh, on, on appropriate legal advice, get a warning, get a warning that hopefully is likely to work. Thank you, Kenji. Kenji Price, you, Carl Smith Ball, Thanks on the evolution of the internet. Thank you so much.